Well, hello, everyone. I'm so happy that we are able to have our authors and editors here for our new book, The Black Reparations Project. I don't know if this is going to show up backwards <laughs> in the video, but we have here today our editors. You, you, should show, you should show people the actual coverage. You can, oh yeah, I'll do that too. Okay, let me yeah, read yeah, the under, the your first, under the jacket. Yeah. That's a good idea. So we have um, William A. Darity Jr., A. Kirsten Mullen, and Lucas Hubbard, who I've come to know very well over the years. It seems like I've known y'all forever now. But I initially showed the, the, the uh, jacket, but this is the beautiful cover of the book. So we encourage you to get a copy of this wonderful uh, book that we're going to talk about here today. And also, I just want y'all to know I'm a faithful reader. I got the original from here to equality. I had to band-aid it. I was tearing the jacket because I read it so much. And then I got the second edition. So yeah. I am on point. <laughs> <laughs> So what do we wanted to do today? Um, Asala has agreed to add this to the YouTube channel. Just a little bit of background about Asala. I don't know if this will record this. I was just gonna go to, I, I opened up all these windows. So Asala is the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. And its founder is Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And so Dr. Carter G. Woodson is also the creator or the progenitor of what was initially called Negro History Week. And he established it in celebration of the fact that both um, Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln had birthdays in February. And so they, I became last year the, their selected freedom scholar. And I also happened to be born in February too on Valentine's Day. So, you know, this is surreal. <laughs> so. Convergence. It, yeah. So, you know, there's a, re, there's a rhyme to the reason. <laughs> and so what I wanted to do today was talk to you all as the editors of this book, give us a little history about its creation, how you went about getting the authors together, and also to promote our upcoming, um, well, I can't say Twitter anymore, X Spaces for Black History Month. And so I'm going to again share those beautiful flyers where you see all our beautiful authors. So on next um, Thursday, February 1st at 6 p.m., we are going to do a Twitter Spaces with all of the authors from the Black Reparations Project. And then we're going to do a follow-up Twitter space on February the 26th. And so we will have an opportunity to talk about this marvelous book and also engage with those persons who are interested in this whole concept of Black reparations and under the umbrella of Black History Month. So just uh, one more thing before I turn it over to y'all about my feelings about Black History Month. So I came out of higher education administration. That's where I cut my teeth. Right after I graduated from uh, undergraduate school, I ended up having a job at a laboratory and I was so bored. So as an undergrad, I was on work study and I worked for the Equal Employment Affirmative Action Officer, Mr. Richard Neal, big up Sam, mentor and supporter of all the black people was going to the University of Akron. He always, you know, looked out for us. So I went in a person, I said, Mr. Neal, I hate this job. I want to do something different. And he invited me to take on what was called a part-time um, staff position at the university. We had gotten a new president, uh, William Muse, and he was very committed to minority affairs work. So he created a cabinet level or, you know, vice president level position that reported directly to him. And it was the vice president of minority affairs. And under the auspices of this position was this part-time job that I took. I said, okay, I'll do that till I find something else. So I ended up kind of creating the first minority program that we had at our campus. And I thought it was just going to be a little foray until I found something else. Well, it did so well at the university in terms of recruiting and, you know, acclimating um, 
black students to the campus that the president turned it into a full-time administrative faculty position. So that's my foray into higher education. So part of my charge was Black History Month. So every year, Black History Month rolls around for me like Christmas because I remember all these wonderful programs. And so that is why I asked you all to kind of be our stars of this event by talking about the Black Reparations Project. So my first question to the authors is, how did the Black Reparations Project begin as an idea? Well, I guess I'd like to try to, to start uh, the answer. And uh, I know that, that both Kirsten and Lucas will have more to add to this. Uh, but interestingly enough, um, I think that the, the inspiration for this project was really uh, the sense that Kirsten and I had that the final chapter of our book, From Here to Equality, which incidentally, and we're very grateful to Asala for this, uh, is was the recipient of the first uh, mm -hmm. book award, uh, first annual book award that Asala, Asala provided. And so uh, we're very proud of that. But the final chapter of From Here to Equality is devoted to the outlining of a plan for reparations for Black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States. Mm -hmm. And after completing the book, we were very much convinced that everything that we said in that final chapter was not the last word on the subject. And so as a consequence, uh, we assembled a group of scholars that we call the Reparations Planning Committee, uh, and that group of scholars obviously includes you as well, Lisa. And um, we asked for the members of that planning committee to develop uh, chapters and essays that would address the questions of how we could best implement a reparations plan for Black American descendants of U.S. slavery uh, that went beyond the kinds of approaches and strategies that we had pursued in chapter 13. Mm -hmm. I, I might add that, um, you know, as we began to talk more about the ideas behind From Here to Equality and um, the historical discoveries that we made and others as well, um, we began to hear some similar questions from, you know, from audiences, from participants that clarified for us where uh, the points of, of, of understanding were, uh, but also, you know, where the, uh, there were issues that were not quite clear. Um, you know, and some of them may seem, you know, pretty basic, but, um, you know, after you hear them several times, you think, okay, there's something to this. We need to really pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of them, uh, that we heard often was this concern that it would be really difficult for individuals to trace their genealogy to an ancestor who had been enslaved in the United States. And so it was really uh, helpful, you know, to have that fabulous uh, chapter from Evelyn McDowell mm -hmm. um, demonstrating that, in fact, there are many more tools, more, more search tools uh, available online, um, but also that, um, you know, but, but also to underscore the point that we made in From Here to Equality, that we believe that the federal government should establish uh, an agency that is staffed with professional genealogists who would conduct research on behalf of individuals who wanted to make a claim uh, at no charge to them. Um, another thing that came up often, um, you know, was our understanding that uh, many people were confused about um, the difference between wealth and income. And uh, people often use the term interchangeably. And so trying to give them, you know, some more information about what we're talking about um, when, when we say we want to, you know, we want to see the racial wealth gap be closed, which is not the same thing as the, 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 the income gap being mm -hmm. closed. So I, I would say just, you know, kind of this compendium of issues, questions that kept coming up in the conversations we were having informed the topics of um, uh, many of the topics of the chapters in um, the Black Reparations Project Handbook. Wonderful. 
Lucas, what was it like for you editing this book and being a part of this project? Well, it was uh, it was really exciting and it was uh, fantastic to be part of such a uh, renowned group of scholars and, and and working on such important issues. And I, I was going to add to your uh, initial question, uh, Lisa, that I came to the reparations planning committee a little bit later on. So when a lot of the scholarship was already underway, I think I joined in late 2019, early 2020. And it it was very exciting to kind of jump into this uh, this ecosystem where where all of this great research was happening. And I think one of our questions was, okay, we have this great research. How do we um, turn it into something that will be accessible to a wider audience? It will reach policymakers and activists and scholars and lawmakers and all of these different folks. And so um, I was fortunate enough to be able to jump in to the process and uh, the, I think the ball was all already rolling with the University of California Press at that point, mm -hmm. uh, but I was able to I, I hope, hopefully uh, contribute in some meaningful way there in terms of uh, making the the arguments um, kind of, uh, what am I trying to say, uh, helping put the arguments together into a volume that is uh, thorough and comprehensive and um, really, you know, no matter how you uh, how familiar you are with the scholarship or uh where you you um how, how what your journey has been to come to this book uh mm -hmm. there's something for you so it, it was it was really um uh, meaningful for me uh, as a a writer and an editor to uh, be able to contribute to this this process that way and I want to say shout out to you, Lucas, because I feel like I've known you forever. You were so helpful to me with my chapters. And being a new faculty member at my institution kind of left me a little insecure with such awesome scholars. But you never made me feel <laughs> without confidence going forward. And you said, hey, can you explain this a little bit more? So I want to say thank you, especially to you and how you work with me. It was always very responsive. But I also forgot to give a shout out to my institution, the University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio, Texas. Not only have they been extremely supportive of my work, they actually created space on our Black History Month website promoting this event. And not, this is part of our Black History Month events. And I want to say thank you to them and the Dreden School of Education, where I am housed. <laughs> and so um, the next question well, I want to before, well, before, yeah. I, well, I want to say something too about, yeah. about Lucas's work too. Oh. Um, one of the things that I especially appreciate um, is, you know, Lucas was helping to make sure, you know, when you have a group of scholars who are writing uh, about different aspects of a particular topic, you want to be sure that um, there's a connection you know, between and across, you know, there's a conversation happening uh, across all the essays, uh, but you don't want a lot of replication. And, um, you know, I think Luca Lucas was incredibly adept at, you know, helping to weave the different uh, trains of thought together um, mm -hmm. and figuring out, you know, where, you know, we may need to, to add a little more, you know, uh, to, to flesh out an idea a bit more, uh, to provide more context in some, in some instances. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to make the work a little bit more concrete, yes. um, which I think is just really crucial uh, for a book of this type. And I mean, you alluded, uh, Lisa, earlier to this notion that, you know, this is a book that you want, uh, or maybe it was Lucas actually, who said you want, you know, people who are familiar with the topic, but also those who are very new to it, to be able to, you know, immediately, um, you know, begin to digest the work. And to to figure out, you know, where are the, the the nuances, where are the issues that they need to become more familiar with, uh, so that they can be, um, uh, you know, in communication with others who are talking about the reparations movement, especially as it relates to Black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Yeah, and I, I wanted to add that initially uh, the vision was to generate. Uh, essentially a report that was self-published mm -hmm. by the Reparations Planning Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when we learned that there was interest on the part of the University of California Press, 
it required us to pivot a bit in terms of how this uh, project was going to be structured. And I think Lucas was instrumental in uh, in helping us make the transition from thinking about putting this out as a report versus putting it out as a book, which mm -hmm. would be an edited volume of essays. Mm -hmm. I also want to mention, of course, that your work, uh, your contribution to the uh, to the to the uh, to the Black Reparations Project, is a an attempt to indicate ways in which adult education. Mm -hmm. can be mobilized for the purposes of informing people about reparations and about reparations advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that this is something that's very, very different from what was originally in From Here to Equality, where we didn't really explore the question of uh, how do you make the general public more aware of these issues and how do you help them become uh, more, more sympathetic to the claim for reparations that's been made by Black American descendants of U.S. slavery for close to 160 years. Absolutely. And shout out to William T. Grant Foundation, who also supported the making of this book and gave us grant fund, uh, funding to, to get that accomplished. And I'm glad you made the pivot to adult education, because as you can see in the background, I have my triple ACE logos, logo on purpose. <laughs> but Similar to what you were saying to Lucas, that was important to me that I write in a style that was accessible. And also by I wanted us to kind of get into this social media space to get at these adults in a, uh, what we call in our field, non-formal education. What are your thoughts about our ability to reach out to adults using these mediums? And do you see this as a means by which we can accomplish some of the things you talked about, Dr. Darity and Lucas, in terms of getting at those adult populations with, you know, the information that's digestible and not too, you know, theoretical and along those lines. I think this is a, this is a huge piece, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you know uh, for the, the project to take on. Um, there are so many platforms now that, um, you know, that one can be on. Um, but in a lot of instances, they're just so episodic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people get just a little taste, a little flavor uh, of an idea. Um, but if we're able to be present on multiple platforms and direct people back to the handbook itself mm -hmm. uh, or to direct them to other books that, um, you know, or articles, reports, that members of the group have written on the topic. I think that's really important. Um, but you know, this is one of the beauties of having a, a group of people who are allied uh, working together. And, and here I'm talking about you know, the individuals who were, were part of the research group initially and those who, um, who prepared essays for this volume, but to, you know, to use the networks that you have um, to get the word out uh, to let this be the base for uh, a book a book group, you know, a book club, for example, uh, or a study group. Um, we've had a number of folks who have used uh, From Here to Equality as mm -hmm. the basis of a research group. Um, and this is a perfect, I think, a perfect book for that, you know, to take one chapter at a time. Uh, perhaps you assign it to different group, different individuals in your group uh, and work through it. Um, but yes, this is, I think, um, social media is the way of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really critical that we seize the opportunity to be present in those spaces. Agreed. Does anyone else want to add to that? I'll, I'll just say that I think sometimes books can seem, you know, a book is published and then it exists in a physical space and it can seem uh, almost static for lack of a better word. And I think something that we really uh, strove for with this book is, is creating something that is dynamic and that it won't just exist in book form. It exists in, in conversations. It, the goal is for uh, everyone to read this book. And then, uh, as Kirsten was saying, jump into the conversation and be interacting and be sharing their thoughts and, and be discussing it with people. And so I, I think, uh, as you said, Lisa, uh, social media is a huge component of that. And I think um, we we would like the the response and the the uh, the audience interaction 
uh, with this to be as dynamic as possible. And I think having conversations in these spaces is, is a huge part of that. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I know I promised you all I wouldn't keep you long. And if I tell you a fib, you won't come back when I ask you again. But I want to mention that we are going to have several of these little spots with some of the authors. So we'll be featuring them in their chapters throughout Black History Month. So if you could for me in a uh, last word, share with the audience your thoughts about Black History Month. And if you want to draw connections to the book, you can do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, 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 I'm thinking uh, that, you know, there's a sense in which the history of Black people in the United States is so well integrated with the history of the nation as a whole that, you know, there's always been the skepticism that some people have had about the necessity of having Black History Month. Uh, because they would say, well, Negro history is part of all American history. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, mm -hmm. it should be something that's that's celebrated and treated in every month of the year. And, and I think while that's true, there is a value to having a month where there's more concentrated attention mm -hmm. to these types of issues, especially in an environment where there is so much activity going on uh, to deny truth telling about mm -hmm. American history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, in that context, I think that the book, The Black Reparations Project, is potentially uh, very, very useful as a, as a tool for conversation during the course of Black History Month. Uh, the only other thing I want to emphasize, though, is that uh, one of the key features of this book is uh, a discussion of uh, detours away from true reparations. And I think that this is a provocation in the book, uh, but it's a provocation that we thought had to be made. And so there are two detours that we talk about at length in the book, and I hope we'll have an opportunity to explore uh, yes. during the course of the, uh, the X space platform yes, events. Definitely. And one of these detours is this uh, fascination that people suddenly have with trying to do something that they're calling reparations at the state and local level. And the other is the attachment that people have to a piece of congressional legislation known as H.R. 40. Okay. Uh, and we think Sandy, that these we don't are want both... you to say too much because we got to have a cliffhanger to get people to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But that's <laughs> coming. Come next week. <laughs> so that's uh, Did you have anything uh, else, Kirsten and Lucas, before we close out? Well, I just want to say briefly, and I won't go into the whole, uh, all of what I was going to say, but I wanted to, you know, affirm that, you know, Black History Month for me is an invitation to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we want to invite uh, others to look, you know, at their own family's history. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, uh, you know, if, 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 if the person is white, you know, to interrogate their family's wealth position and find mm -hmm. out, you know, what the source of that money is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many, many white people will say, oh, you know, my family, you know, we didn't own, we didn't own uh, slaves uh, or we came to the United States after the period of slavery had ended. We didn't benefit from that at all. Um, but I think there are all kinds of uh, connections to largesse that mm -hmm. was handed out by the U.S. federal government that white Americans received that black Americans did not. That's and it's important for people to to, to understand that history, um, mm -hmm. to, to, to know where their family stood and how uh, they were, how the position that they occupy, the financial position that they occupy currently mm -hmm. um, was assisted uh, by the, the U.S. federal government. Lucas, Black History Month. <laughs> Um, I feel like this is a trap for for me to have the last word on Black History Month. You want? I'm, 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 I'm very, <laughs> I'm very wary of the optics of it. Uh, but no, uh, I I think I think what Kirsten said was spot on there. I think you know, um, no matter what we look like, there is uh, the 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 history of Black people in this country is is intertwined with our history. And uh, you know, as a, a a white person from a white family, like there's um, there's undoubtedly things to for for someone like me to interrogate during this period um and i think there's uh th there much like the the book that we wrote has something for everyone i think uh black history month uh has 
something for everyone if they uh, so choose to be deliberate about it. And I think, you know, what, what our book is doing, and I think what Black History Month does as well, is it, it encourages that uh, deliberate uh, education that, that everyone should be seeking out. So I hope that uh, the Black Reparations Project can uh, be a part of uh, people's education in that manner. Absolutely. And, you know, I just reflect on my last chapter and something that I think I'm pretty sure I borrowed it from Dr. Woodson, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, where he said that Black history was co-equal history with American history. You know, and I like that that idea because there were some distinctions that were made because of a society that was based on, you know, uh, separation, legal separation by race. And that even in the midst of all of that, we were able to make substantive and amazing contributions that have benefited us as a larger country, even to this very day. So I just want to thank you all for your time. I look forward to seeing you all next week. And I that's all I got. <laughs> thank you for my <laughs> inaugural launch of the YouTube channel for Asala. See you all next week. Bye-bye. Thank See you. Bye-bye.